I'm Josh Barrow, host of Left, Right, and Center, KCRW's weekly forum for civilized debate across the political spectrum. Today's news cycle demands more time for deeper analysis. So Left, Right, and Center is now a full hour every week. Subscribe and listen at kcrw.com slash LRC. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. You have this kind of asymmetrical warfare coming from a guy who's great at a soundbite, lousy at an answer. So are you looking for your own billionaire? Nope. No, I don't want my own billionaire. I'm going to raise the vast majority of the money. Brace yourself, America, for what? King Trump. <laughs> I'm Warren Alney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. The Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. But, but let's put it this way. The film World's End for President has one of my favorite lines by its protagonist who said, this is going to be my apocalypse now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the protagonist, the central figure of the film, Roseanne for president, Roseanne Barr sitting across me, and the director, Eric Weinberg. Eric, first, oh, thanks you for being here. Thank you very much. And tell me how you guys met. Go for it, Eric. We he met, remembers. I don't remember. We met at the L.A. premiere of the Michael Moore movie, Capitalism, A Love Story. Uh, Roseanne was at the premiere with her mom, and we that's where we met. We started talking there, and then we met over the years many times at his many events. And then Roseanne was guest hosting the Joy Behar show in 2011, and she had Michael on as her guest, and I was working with Michael at the time. And so I went with him to the studio. And that was a pretty fateful night, which is included in the film. Yeah. Exactly. We were, we were real glad they let us use the footage. Well, Michael was my guest, and, uh, you know, I think I was talking about NAFTA. I asked his, his opinion of NAFTA, and uh, he said, you know, we need to have people who really care run for office. That's our problem. And I said, that's exactly what I've been thinking, and that's why I think I'm going to do it. And he said, do it. And I said, well, who do you know that uh, you know can film it for me and help me? And he said, Eric. Because one of the things that's so interesting about it is we get to see Roseanne in repose, quiet in thought. And I just realized in Washington, that's not something we see, we see very often. No, it's not. And that's what people were saying. How did I feel about really opening myself up more than I ever had for the real me rather than, you know, a character I'm playing? Well, your you know? stage persona. Yep, yeah, stage persona. And the thing that always strikes me about watching comedians when they're off stage is that people don't understand that when you're on stage, you're doing an act. Right. That's not you. Right. So your speaking voice is different, your posture is different, and just capturing all that, must have, or allowing all that, was that a difficult thing for you to do? I just wanted uh, to let people see me think and write and speak and risk. So Because I thought, well, you know, people forget that somebody paid the cost. And I feel I paid the cost to be the boss. And uh, I spoke truth to power on television for a decade and uh, almost a decade. And I never lost the desire to speak truth to power through comedy or on behalf of uh, working people. So it was like, wow, it was all... How it really started for me, though, I tell this story. I, I wanted to give a speech Mother's Day 2000... 2010. 11, 10? Yep. The day before that, I had been to my mentor's funeral... And it was so moving. Who was that? That was Mary Daly, who was a professor at Boston University. And she was an author and uh, a feminist philosopher and a mentor, and I loved her so much. And I went to her funeral, and I began to write for her. And I stayed up 36 straight hours writing the speech. And then I told Eric, I want you to film me giving the speech across the street from the White House because... You know, it's just time that somebody was saying it. And uh, so, you know, I wrote it, and that was the most exciting thing. And then going there to speak it, it was just fantastic. I, I knew I was entering a new time in my life. And I said, I, Roseanne Barr, after a successful television show and raising five children who all turned out to be useful members of society, have just taken it upon myself to fix everything because these people are idiots. 
they don't want to fix nothing. And that's when I realized, oh, they don't want it fixed. But I thought, well, it, they're such a simple and cheap solution. And I know they're greedy hogs and everything. So why wouldn't they want to make even more effing money? So I was like, why wouldn't they want the thing that saved them money? And so I put together a, a campaign strategy that I speak there in the park, and it is how to solve every problem on earth. And I think I did it really well and very concise because it was only like 25 minutes. And we filmed it. And uh, actually, we didn't get this part didn't make the film, but I, I did go around the park and talk to the crazy people there. And I said, do you think it's crazy that I, I want to run for president? And they were some crazy people. You know, they lived in the park. I said, do you think we're crazy to that guy who had all those words written on his face? And I can't remember. Start loving. Start loving. And he, he stood in front of the White House something like for 16 years with pamphlets about freedom of speech and our civil rights, our combined civil rights. And, and he said, well, I dare say, Roseanne, that as crazy as I am and you are, we're nothing as crazy as these people walking around out here. And then there was this other guy. What was his name? My favorite crazy guy with the no pants. Nature Boy? Nature Boy. He he lives in the park, and uh, he's African-American with very, very long dreads, longer than yours even. And he doesn't, he doesn't wear any clothes, and he, he doesn't have any teeth. But, you know, when you meet somebody like that, they're the ones who know the real truth sometimes. And I go, first of all, do you think you're crazy? And he said, oh, yeah, I know I'm crazy. And I said, well, how do you how do you know? What's the criterion that you're judging? He goes, because I know the real reason that we're here on this earth and why we are alive, and it's not run after money and stuff. So I was like, well, well, well what is it? And he goes into this thing, and it was the, it was, it was the real thing about living in nature and being comfortable with living in nature. And it was so weird because right then I was uh, home in Hawaii and I was working with other people, not just me, but our, our, my community there. I'm a farmer there, organic farmer. And, uh, you know, we put our heads together and we kicked Monsanto's ass. We kicked Monsanto off the big island. And, you know, I was just coming from all that and going, I should run for president because somebody who knows how to fix should run. And, you know, when you know how to fix stuff, I hope I'm not swearing badly. But no, you're swearing very when well. You, when you really care, there is a solution to everything. And crazy people kind of know what it is. Well, they know simplicity. By the way, I should say it's the treatment. The voice you hear on the other microphone is Roseanne Barr. She's a central figure of Roseanne for president. It's director. Eric Weinberg is also sitting with me here. And I guess I have to ask you, especially hearing her talk and just hearing what she sounds like when she's not being Roseanne, if it was that other side of her that attracted you to this material, Eric? Yeah, well, also I grew up with Roseanne, as as many of us did. But I, the thing about up... that is we think we know her. There have been so many articles, and you right. show some of those magazine covers and so many of those interviews. It's the idea we think we know her until we see this film. Well, I, I know that she's an artist, and I always am drawn to artists who are not afraid to take risks and to stick their necks out and to uh, fight for what they believe in regardless of the consequences. And I'm always fascinated by people who do that. I think everyone should do that, artist or not. And I was interested in getting to know Roseanne as a person and seeing what makes her tick and connecting with her as a person more than as a celebrity. Well, but it's also the idea of showing there are sometimes we see these documentaries that are intimate about celebrities, but we don't ever get to hear anybody's philosophy. I mean, there's, their take on fame is, is about as philosophical as they get. And really hear the sort of the bare bones of who she is and uh, hear her say that when she was three years old, she took this vow she's never going to see people suffer again, which is a remarkable moment in the movie. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you were interested in, wasn't it? Yes, and that's who Roseanne is. So it's not just when the camera's there. I'd imagine when you and Johnny are sitting around at home, you're, you're concocting solutions to the world's problems all day, every day. Oh, yeah, because like Johnny and I say, Johnny, my boyfriend of 15 years, he's also a, a writer, and that was our common bond there. We, we love words. And uh, as he said, it's not his quote, but he told it. I love it so much. It's like it, all, all this stuff is strung together with words, and words can take it apart. And I just like, wow, that's always been how comedy was to me and what the power of a narrative and, and words when they're true, 
not when they're BS, because that never that's just a waste of time and everybody knows it. But when words are true and they go to the ear of the listener, man, that some powerful stuff happens. And, you know, you just look at the speeches of people who have changed this country. I love speeches. And I thought, you know, that was another good thing about running for president. I'd write speeches and give speeches because I realized that's all there really is to being the president. Did you like, <laughs> did you like writing the speeches? I loved made, it. In a way, it's kind of like building an act, isn't it? Because you've got to yeah. be a persona and you've got to, and as a comedian, you're very precise with language. I mean, I'm glad there's that clip from the very beginning when you're on Carson and you use the phrase domestic goddess. So I just remember how that stuck with me all these years later. I still, if I hear those words, I hear you doing Carson at night and I wonder if you felt like you had to be that precise with language when you were writing your speeches for the campaign as well. Yeah, I thought I had to be even more precise because I knew, like we say in our country and all over the world, where we say, well, you are going for people's hearts and minds. And that is what you want to touch. And that is, you know, what you want in return because you're giving yours, you know. So you want to meet like with like. And I did uh, just that. And when it was received... It was so joyous. I mean, it was just a blast, a just a blast. And they were my words. And that, that was the other good thing for me. It was cathartic because for, for quite a while, people take your words apart and change them. Sometimes you don't like what they've done. But just to be have the total artistic freedom to just write my own words and build them exactly like I wanted to build them. And it is like telling a story. Just like on Roseanne, it was, you know, six segments with a break in between. Each segment has to have a beginning, middle, and end. So they'll come back. So it is building. So I, I was able to use those skills that I learned on the show. And I hadn't exercised them for a while because I'm too lazy to write anything <laughs> unless there's a deadline. Like, it's like, oh, my God, he's going to film me tomorrow night, and there's a deadline. Well, I'd say so, one of the sections I really liked about the film, too, is the session where Farheen is where your campaign manager in Minnesota. Oh, my God, she is the hero of this movie, and we so wanted to talk about her. I mean, once I met Farheen, it was like, I, I can't let Farheen down. And she felt that way about me, too. She couldn't let me down because we knew that between me and her and and Cynthia, who was traveling a lot, Cynthia was going all over the world speaking, that it was mostly me and Farheen, and that means it was mostly Farheen. And there's that whole section where she basically, you, you, you can feel the pressure and how much this means there, she says. Well, because Farheen's family, here's what happened. Farheen's family pretty much built the Green Party themselves, their family in the Midwest. So it was for her. She had, before that, she had run for the governorship of Minnesota, too, so she was very involved, and she was the Green Party in the Midwest. So, you know, those were her friends and her people. And, God, it, it really wrenches my guts out when I watch that movie because I feel like Farheen or her friends didn't come for her. And that's just a, just an awful feeling, but it doesn't stop her. Like, she became my hero, you know. But during the filming of this movie, two of her brothers were murdered. So it, it took on a big, big weight, and several people died during this movie. It took on a big, big weight, too, so that it was for people who, the, their spirit, too. So it was, like, so meaningful and deep, you know. It was not a publicity stunt. Roseanne says it wasn't a publicity stunt. I want to tell you a story about when she did deliver that first speech in the park on Mother's Day in 2010 in Lafayette Park in D.C., the first thing she said is, do you think we can do this? Can we get a permit? So oh, I, yeah. we secured a permit to do it. And then we were going to go and do it. And I said, Roseanne, did you announce that you're doing this speech? No. Well, does any of the press know that you're doing this speech? No. Do you want cameras there or sound there? No. I was like, nobody's going to be there and nobody's ever going to know what happened. And Roseanne says, I don't care. <laughs> I've always wanted to be the crazy woman in the park screaming about socialism screaming about utopia and yeah and and, and finally she was able to do that i was like it wow was she actually wants true. to do this to simply deliver a speech to anybody who was willing to listen to the park well nature boy listened to it eventually she agreed that we could bring a camera and film it mm -hmm. thank heavens and that was our first shoot actually but i feel like this whole thing for you the whole the watching the entire movie is really like watching you try to figure out which voice you're using because that's exactly right god you're so good why are you so smart like that 
You're the first person to say that. This is the point we take a break before I start blushing on the radio. It's the treatment my guests are the director of Roseanne for President, <laughs> Eric Weinrib, and the star of the film Roseanne Barr. There's more to come. Stay with us. Long before podcasts, there were radio novellas. Celestial Blood is the first ever to combine the two. One version in English and another one in Spanish. Listen with your grandma, only from KCRW. This podcast is produced by nonprofit radio station KCRW. Support the podcast you enjoy by donating at kcrw.com slash join. And thanks. Welcome back. I'm giving Roseanne Barr words. It's the treatment. She's here along with the director of the film, Roseanne for President, Eric Weinrip. I want to go back to Farheen a little bit just because you must have felt, Eric, when that you had that thing that reminds us what politics are about, which is about people's sort of call to a cause and this thing that was bigger than her, but she's one person who can make a difference. And the other interesting thing about it, too, is realizing that the Green Party is just as institutionalized as any other political oh, party. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a bummer, man. That That's, was, to me, the real uh, heartbreak of the movie. Yeah. yeah. The heartbreak. And I said to Cynthia McKinney, the the former congresswoman, Democratic congresswoman, who later was a Green Party candidate, and I asked her, you were a Democrat and you're also a Green. What happens, you know, what we see in the Green Party, the dysfunction here, I imagine, it's it's way worse in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And she said, oh, no. She said, I've never seen anything like the Green Party, <laughs> the disarray that it's in. And I think it's just because of the lack of resources and everyone is stretched so thin and everything's stretched so thin and they're up against this beast. Mm-hmm. I think maybe that's part of it too. But let me ask you guys this because it felt like to me as much as anything else that people get involved with politics because of ego. Mm-hmm. And yes. you were saying, and you say in the film on, uh, on a couple of occasions that if you just use common sense, yeah. you want the person running for office who can bring the most people into the tent. But that's common sense. This is not about that. This is, you know how Noam Chomsky says that you manufacture consent? Well, I say they also manufacture dissent and they control the opposition. So, you know, in so many ways, some things are supposed to fail. And, uh, you know, it's theater. And uh, I thought that about the Green Party and I I came away with that. and. Uh, It's all kind of depressing, except for when you think the following, that this is the first year in American election history where almost 16 percent of people are voting for third parties. So that gives me some hope, you know. That's a lot of people. And already we knew that uh, almost 40 percent of the American public does not vote because they know it doesn't do any good to vote. It's not because they're stupid and all the other stuff that people say, but... My whole campaign, I I felt like it was to them that I was speaking like, hey, you know, what if we did actually have a functional government and we could get it simply by using the technology and the machine that exists, like they say, you know, when the people seize the means of production. Well, when the people seize the means of government, we'll have the government we want. And so that means we're going to have to, like, get past all this stuff they're doing to us to faction us and put us at each other's throats and separate us. We're going to have to talk to each other and work together so that we can be assured to, you know, receive something back for our taxes. As you're saying this, though, and I was wondering if this is one of the things you liked about making the movie, Eric, I remind you of a time in this country, just reading the history of this country in the 20s, where socialism wasn't this thing that scared people. No, that it, it, was, it was a call to power. It was this thing right. that built unions. And, and it almost feels like for you, Eric, part of the reason to make this film is a way to sort of remind people that socialism is about ideas, not about taking things away from people. I think the real reason for me to make the movie is it's a call to action for everyone to get involved, regardless of what they believe in, regardless of their political persuasion. I think that people need to get off their couches and get involved and, and for fight and for what they believe in. seek solutions, not a way to blame other people, but work with people to devise solutions. You know, I talk in common sense. I know that, and nobody can understand it. It's always driven me crazy my whole life. What do you mean nobody can understand it? Because it's too simple, what I say. And it's just so they're always looking for the guile. Well, you know, I just say what I know I'm supposed to say. 
I like what you asked me on the break. You said you, you said that watching the movie, you thought it was about me deciding which voice to use. Yeah. Man, is that deep. I really thank you for that because that is exactly what it was. It, it is about finding your voice. But for me, I, I'm a person who's been internally factioned since I was very little. I've had uh, different teams in my head, you know, and different ones different parts of me have played different parts. And I do have a stage persona that I look at as another part of me. But I have one that's really, really me, like who I am right now. Me, this me, I was never comfortable showing anyone. Because? Because they say it's crazy. And you don't want to get a lobotomy and you don't want to go to a state mental institution if you have mental illness, so you learn to disguise it. And that's been my story. But this movie, allowing me to find my voice, me, my voice, was very cathartic and good. Because the thing about this is because of your book, and basically your life is, and we see this in the movie, Eric, is about basically regrouping and finding a voice after a trauma. Yeah, exactly. I mean, going to a mental institution or the or the accident. Or even My the... first thing was getting hit in the head. Yeah. And that's why I love that these athletes now in the football league and stuff, they're starting to talk about what happens when you get a head injury. And, you know, it's not. It's a terrible, terrible thing, and it takes a really long time to recuperate from it. And uh, that was the first thing that happened to me, and... Uh, I changed a lot after this head injury. But I already had a lot of those changes inside, but I didn't show them. So then I started, like, doing a whole bunch of different things that made no sense to people. But, you know, I think now that I'm 64, I've pulled it all back in. And a lot of pulling it back in for me was to realize that when I feel that I am needed and of service to the whole bunch of people, man, I feel so good. And I bring up the thing, too, about you finding voices and basically bouncing back from these traumas because yeah. you use that so often in the movie, Eric. We, that's kind of almost this, this the connecting material, that this idea of her hitting a wall and just getting up and going right over the wall has always been this, this kind of motivation that she's had. Well, I can't let idiots win. Ever since I was a kid, I just was like, I can't do it. I wish I could. Sometimes, like, you know, I don't have a thing to like a big band-aid to put over my mouth i should stay quiet but i just can't no please otherwise i have another eight <laughs> minutes to film that would be really bad <laughs> but i think w what i like about this again and i wonder if that, that was somebody because you use this stuff in the movie that all these things that you that her life has been these series sort of again not, not just bouncing back but just going over that wall um yeah. that that happens we see that a lot in the movie and you must have been fascinated by just having this come up as often as it did yeah and I think these were, were big events, as Roseanne's saying, these were big events in her life that affected very deeply who she is as a person and, and trying to tell the personal story because, I mean, look, it's a political movie, but I went in there and I, I saw it as a responsibility to tell a more personal story of Roseanne and what makes her tick. And getting to, getting to hang out with Roseanne and have a good time and travel around and get to know each other as people, that to me was... And smoke a lot of dough. Smoke a lot of weed. That was as much fun as uh, the political part of the movie. <laughs> but, you know, I, it's a good thing. And I am for legalization. That was one of my mottos was, uh, yes, we cannabis. And, uh, you know, that will, as I say, that will save our country and it will save women's lives. You mentioned common sense, and one of the things that you've used common sense so often to combat, and we see a clip of it in the movie, is going back to the, the kiss, the, the lesbian oh, kiss yeah. on the show, mm -hmm. and you sort of say, this is common sense. So the idea that you could use common sense to fight what seems like the most entrenched bureaucracy there is, which is network television, which yeah, is afraid is. of everything. Right? So if I get that on, why could you not do that's politics? How I was, uh, that's why I was tooting my own horn there going, I and I alone changed these highly conservative males in television. I convinced them that gay characters in the family hour was a good idea. And nobody can top that. I mean, come on. And it was a hard one, too. It's really hard to do it. And it took a toll on my nervous system. But the idea that you could do that, and it's just about standing your ground and making this simple argument that would sound crazy if you're 
conservative and afraid of rocking the status quo, it would stand to reason for you. You would think, well, why couldn't this get me the candidacy for this political party? That's what I did think. Yeah. And like Farheen and Cynthia and I were talking all the time. It's like, why is this not connecting? Why is this not connecting? But it didn't connect with the delegates. That was the whole story. But when afterwards, when I lost the nomination, you know, I would go out to thousands of people and connect with them. But these six people who are gatekeepers, they, you know. They circled the wagons. Yeah, they circled the wagons. You want to think that this. I'm a threat comes to them. Because. Because I, I don't mouth party lines, I think. And I don't repeat and regurgitate rhetoric and useless bullshit that doesn't work. I know what will make things work. And they just happen to be the same things that make everything good work. It's like truth and one law for everybody. Hello, that's it. Well, let's get on this. And like I'm saying about this, me, ever since I was little, you know, I just want to say this because it's NPR and everything. I believe in God. I believe in that there's no higher truth than truth. So that's God. Well, see, you talk about Period. truth, and one of the things I thought was a great truth, which struck me as being even funnier because it was both ironic and absolutely true, is that these people were such bad comedians. These, oh, the candidates? The, yes. They're all they're trying to tell jokes, and they suck. And everybody's like, oh, Obama, he has really good timing in the way he takes it. He does not. He waits two beats too long before he says the punchline, and we have these arguments. But anyway, they're all trying to tell a joke. So it's like that, I can that... tell a joke. <laughs> Dang, I can tell a I can tell a joke based on truth. But then the other side of it too is that because you've been so successful, and this is a big part of the movie too, so successful in something that people don't think was being work, yeah. which is entertainment. Well, they don't think comics work. They, they think we just come flying off the seat of our pants with. They, they don't see that we measure every word and beat like a musician, you know. That's, they like, that's what I'm saying that. about precision of language. I mean, yeah, again, right. domestic goddess. How long did it take you to come up with that turn of phrase, Well, I stole it, so that one was easy. <laughs> from, from? I stole it from, uh, well, I asked her permission, I want to say that, but uh, she wrote a book called um, The Fascinating Womanhood. Oh, um, uh, Helen B. Andelin. Yes. And it was when I was a little girl, my mom and her neighbor, like women friends, they used to gather there and they, they'd be reading this fascinating womanhood. And, of course, I was the oldest daughter, so I'd be scrubbing the floors, making dinner, doing the dishes while she sat there on her fat ass because that's how it is in uh, a lot of <laughs> Jewish families. Anyway, so they'd be reading and studying how they're going to get their husbands to buy them. A, and it really pissed me off because I was only about eight or so. So the, this one thing is like, uh, all to get your husband to buy a damn blender. And I was like, I'm going to buy my own blender. I'm not going to suck up to somebody. And, and then my mom would always tell me how you get a boyfriend. Well, you get them to talk about themselves. And I'd be like, I don't give a SH whatever about them. I'm the interesting one. It didn't make any sense to me. I knew I was more interesting than them. I tried to sit and listen to them talk about shop or whatever the hell it was. Ooh, I, I'm the interesting one. So it's like I knew the world was upside down real early. I don't even know why I'm going off on this. Oh, yeah, and it was domestic goddess. And so I was like, oh, my God, I overheard that. and I don't know, it just stuck in my head. And so later I was like, I prefer to be called domestic goddess. But it's that thing you were talking about, how comedy demands concentration and hard work and precision is because when people laugh, and I've always thought this is the thing, you tell me if you think I'm wrong. When people laugh, they don't think about why they laugh. It's just got to come easy to people, and, and clearly it does not. No, it certainly does not. Jackie Mason, he's, he's all crazy and all, but he had this great quote the other day I read in the newspapers. It says that, I hope it was Jack. No, it's Mel Brooks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so bad at names. Oh, my God. It's Mel Brooks. Oh, my God. And he said that he loves doing stand-up still because he says sometimes the energy is so incredible that had he been wearing a hat, it would have blown off. And that's what it feels like. Well, it's a great movie. The movie is Roseanne thank for you. President. The director is Eric Weinrib and Roseanne Barr. Thank you guys so thank much for doing this. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. Our recording engineer here at NPR West is Patrick Murray. The show is mixed by Kat Yours, edited by Blake Bite, who's the associate producer. Roseanne thinks I'm smart. It's the truth. You're, you're good. 
catch up on past episodes with the treatment, go to KCRW.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. Ta-da.